is Pixels and Plow here, Dougie and Reese. And we're doing something a little bit different this time. We're trying to go with our HD approach, give you some nice video quality, give you some nice audio quality, but we're bringing back the banter, which we sadly lost for the last two editions. Say hello, mate. Hey, guys. How's it going? Now, you're not normally the chronic offender with the absolutely shithouse internet connection like I am, but I'm sure everyone will appreciate seeing your beautiful face in extra clarity. I hope so. Probably not. <laughs> and even if they don't, fuck them. What are we talking about today, mate? Today, we're talking about some different harmonic techniques that you can use that are just a little bit more interesting. We both have uh, two examples each. This is for Eric's to Whitaker, your Eric. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. What do you got first up for us? Uh, my first idea is sort of based on the Jazz 251 in minor. Um, I'll show you an example first and then we can break it down. I'll start us off. Uh, getting into a C minor sort of sound. Take two. That was a few 251s, wasn't it? That was a few 251s. Basically, what I was doing was, I was basing it off of the 251, like I said, but what I was doing was, after the 5 chord, I was actually going to the flat 6 chord and treating that as if it were the flat 2 major chord of the new key. And then, and then I was okay. moving that bass note up a half step to the 2 minor 7, which would then go into the 5-7 and again, instead of going into the minor 1 it would go into the flat 6 major 7 and you could theoretically go on and on like that until you go through all 12 keys So, what kind of movement are you doing on each modulation? You're going down a tone each time? It works out that you end up going down a fourth each time but you never actually end up playing the one chord of the new key that you're in that's a mind fuck. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, boy. The, the only time you'd play the one chord, you don't even have to do it, but if you just ever wanted to end that cycle, or just keep going. The minor seven flat five becomes the flat two of the new key, is that right? That's correct. It was an idea that I took from Koji Kondo, actually. Uh, he, he was the composer for a lot of the Legend of Zelda uh, games before, and in the piece Oath to Order from Majora's Mask, uh, there's a B section in that which actually does the 2 flat major 7 to the 2 minor 7 flat 5. I took that idea and I just totally opened it wide open. <laughs> Thank you. 
can do too, if you noticed when I went through that example initially, that chord that we end up on right there, if you wanted to end the cycle right there without going through all the 12 keys like I was saying, that ends up being the flat 6 major 7 of the key you're already in. So it can just be a handy little way to get to that chord that brings you out of key just for a brief moment. I had a little bit of an example kind of similar to what, what Reese was doing there in terms of having some complicated modulations and they happen to work just by nice voice leading. Uh, I've got a notated example here I'll show on screen for you but it goes a little something like this. Take seven. It's cool. Um, I think a lot of it just works on the fact that there's a lot of chrom chromatic voice leading. Uh, the first one's and a lot of altered seven chords. That seems to be what's working there. So a lot of them are coming from that melodic minor kind of sound, which I guess gives it that, that jazzy flavor. And trying to find some structures which you're just playing up the neck, stuff which stays the same, even though like it'd be going through different keys. It relies on the strength of the melodic structure itself to carry it. So, uh, this, this first part here, um, D7 sharp 9. C sharp major 7 or D flat major 7. There's so many key changes here, like it's hard to keep up with the enharmonics for it, to be honest. I don't think that there's one good way of explaining all the chord changes in that idea. And you'll, you'll see it on screen, so the sharps in... The sh I've chosen to notate with sharps for the most part, but uh, some of them look pretty disgusting. There's some there's some chords in there which you wouldn't see too too often, so pardon the horrific enharmonics. But there's there's some stuff happening like um, it gets down to this this chord here, like a I guess it's a F sharp major nine sharp eleven. That's the overall tonality. Yeah. It's got this melodic structure here keeps coming back over different chords and over like a G minor 7 then over a reasonably hideous polychord B flat over E Some of these structures, these are just pretty much your drop two seven voicings at the top there. And if you play around with them, you can get some nines or some sus two sounds there. And the shapes end up being quite similar. So you have a lot of parallel voicings as it moves down the neck. And then you've got one there, A minor, seven flat five. Rising over, there'd be a lot of choices to play over that. And I think the, what makes this idea work so much is that chromatic movement. One of the things I've liked to employ into my writing, I guess my study of music, is to find chords that sound good next to each other chromatically. One of the easy ones I've always noticed sounds quite great is when you go from a major seven to a minor seven one semitone away, so something like this. It's a pretty sweet sound. I think you'll find a lot of your common voicings work well like that. If you go between uh, major seven to minor seven flat fives as well, that works quite well. I think 
that one works reasonably well because you've got the the one quarter of the major scale and then the seven is always that minus seven flat five. So it's kind of like you're transposing down a tone as you as you're modulating. <laughs> second thing that I have is sort of based off of something I saw by a channel called Holistic Songwriting. I think that's what they're called. They did an episode on Radiohead and the way that they write chord progressions. And one of the things that they talked about was how they like to use both genders of chords, the, the major and the minor, in the same progression. So I sort of took that idea and ran with it. And I have two different treatments of it. I'll play you the first one. Dude, that's such a great channel, by the way. There's a lot of, I guess, very unnerdy ways of looking at songwriting, which is good, a good kind of counter to the way we're normally looking at stuff. Side point, that guy who uh, runs that channel, I think his name's Friedemann. He's got a book called The Addiction Formula, which is really good. It kind of breaks down. I've heard about that. The core ways yeah. about writing pop music. Uh, Jess is actually reading it at the moment. It seems like it's a really good, really good read. And not too techy as well, so a lot of people can appreciate the art of it. Nice. Fire into your examples, man. The two genders. I, I like that. It's it's very German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what ended up happening there was everything I was playing was over a C pedal point. The chords that I was playing in the right hand were C minor, C major, and the C major ends up functioning as a secondary dominant to F major, and then the third of the F major drops down the semitone to F minor, which gives us a minor plagal cadence back to C minor. And again, like I said, that was all over a C pedal. So when I got to the F chords, they ended up being in second inversion. Yeah, it's pretty clever voice leading, man. It's quite Radiohead to end up on the, the minor four anywhere. I think that's the Radiohead sound, right? Yeah. I, I liked his, his video on Radiohead's um, songwriting. But I guess I just see Radiohead, if you, if you overlay the Ionian scale with the Aeolian scale in a particular key and just borrow chords and modal interchange across the two, that to me is mainly the, the, the Radiohead sound. What do you reckon? For sure, for sure. But I ended up taking this idea, like I said, and I've got a different version of it where I actually start to move the bass notes around. It ends up coloring the chords in different ways. So I'll play you that example now. Sure, go for it. So what ended up happening there was in the right hand I was still playing the same chords C minor, C major, F major, F minor but I had the bass moving down stepwise, you could say. So the C minor was still a C minor. I had the C in the bass, but then that went down a tone to B flat as I played the C. So we have a C over B flat. It gives you a C dominant seven sort of sound. Then... What kind of sound did you say it was, man? Did you say the Muse sound? Muse sound? Yeah. Pure me his bro. Is it? <laughs> Pure muse, man. And voicing the C7 as a C over B flat is cool because then I moved the B flat down to the A, meaning we had a semitone movement in the bass down to the major third 
of the F major chord. So now the F major is in first inversion as opposed to second inversion like the first example. Then to finish off the A moved up to a D flat so it goes up a major third or technically a diminished fourth because of the spelling and it transforms that F minor chord into a D flat. Neapolitan bra. <laughs> what was that? Neapolitan bra. If you haven't learned by now, I'm all about those Neapolitans and different <laughs> ways to use them. <laughs> Get your ice cream out, bra. It's Neapolitan <laughs> time. <laughs> Get that ice cream and that pizza out. <laughs> Oh no! I take it you don't listen to much Muse, bro. They're they're pretty damn good. They have you would like their chord movements for sure. That one there, this one here that you did. That's pure Muse. Okay. F minor F sh over F sharp. Talk about chili seeds. Chili seeds, that's extra spicy. So spicy. <laughs> Almost as spicy as these licks. That sounded very not flow. Muy picante. The only thing smoother than the licks in Smooth by Carlos Santana is the smoothness of Carlos Santana's ball sack. I'm just guessing. <laughs> it's interesting that both of Reese's ideas kind of segue well into what I was talking about. He had his first example with the minor two five ones and some interesting modulations, and you were just talking then about pedal point in one of your examples. And I think pedal point is often a really great way of writing stuff. And it's usually working when people are leaving a big gap between the bass notes and whatever chords they're doing on top. The more you kind of get close together in the middle, you get a bit more of the mushy sound. But one of the things I don't think people think about in terms of pedaling notes too much, I hear, uh, hear it sometimes used like in more of a metal context where people are using higher notes and pedaling back to them rather than having like your your padded out bass note so you know you'll, you'll see like an Iron Maiden type of thing where they're doing I'm thinking like uh, keeping pedals in mind more like you would hear sympathetic resonance or a drone note from like a sitar or a bagpipe and it works pretty well on a guitar where you've got like you've got the open E, B and G strings which are quite high up where you could you could have the open string there and if you know your intervals well, compared to the, 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 the roots there, for example, that'd be the root, major seven, or it's more really a minor second interval there, but if you think about them as being a, an octave high, that can help. And I think this can be quite a good melodic technique. It can be applied to other things other than the, other than the, open strings. For example, if you fretted like an F sharp there and you know that having it as a common tone there at the at the top of what you're doing. But it does work really, really effortlessly when you're using the open string. So if you're playing stuff where you do have an E, B, G, or possibly even a D D related chord where that's the root. way to learn the relationships of notes uh, and intervals across the neck to the open string. It's not something that everyone always knows. People often know when you start from a root, what are the intervals when you go above it there? Quite well, people are quite good at knowing that 10 frets above a note on the guitar is a minor seventh, for example, but they might not be thinking about it going down sometimes. So this gives you an alternative way of thinking about guitar, thinking about your melodic choices and uh, can spice up your playing a bit. And it's quite easy to switch between minor, major, and other modal tonalities with this too.
different way to think about pedal point as opposed to the example Rescape before. I think that about wraps it up, man. We're trying to keep this a bit shorter so we're not keeping people with us for over an hour. I'm sure we'll have some long format episodes going forward, but this is cool. Good to try out the new format with the new video, new lighting and audio, etc. Got any parting words? Yeah, new format. We used to do it in MP4, now we're doing it in MOV. <laughs> Muy picante. <laughs> Guess it wouldn't be an episode of Pixels and Plow related material without some hideous, hideous chords to go out together. Hit it, Pixels. <laughs>